you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Uh, he's slightly intoxicated, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Welcome to the Ultrasound Podcast, this is Matt, I'm here with Mike. We're going to talk about pericardial effusion and tampodod today. Mike was recently in charge of an echo lab at ASAP. And this is one of the stations that we taught, pericardial fusion and tamponade. Specifically, I taught this station. And I appreciate Mike asking me to help out with the lab. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute, Matt Dawson's going to teach me about pericardial fusion and tamponade? Wait, this is echo stuff. Why is Matt talking about it? And let me, let me tell you, he had to give this lecture 15 times at ASAP. So I'm confident that after giving it 15 times, saying the same words over and over and over again, he's probably only going to get two or three things wrong. True story. Uh, the instructors that Mike asked to quote unquote help with this lab literally gave the same talk 15 times. Uh, but not to say Mike didn't do some work. He did do a full two minute lecture like three times. So uh, come on now. It was a 10 minute lecture and I did write the freaking lecture for you. Whatever. So anyway, I think it's important to say before we get started that if we don't survive to end of this podcast, it's because we froze to death. We're in Quebec City right now and it's the coldest city on earth. Bonsoir, Mike. Bonsoir, Matt. We, we actually walked to the store a little while ago, and I'm still trying to put my ears back on. They froze off. This place is ridiculous. It's only November. Can you imagine what this place is like in January? Pretty, uh, it's a pretty amazing conference, though. Jean-Francois and Maxime, are, who are here helping teach uh, EGLS, if you remember that podcast. And it's a great group, great conference. All the attendees are pretty incredible, too. I will say I'm, uh, I'm a little uh, not quite as impressed with the, the people of Quebec City when walking around. I mean, Mike and I heard that, that they actually appreciate it if you try to speak their language. And so every time somebody says merci, we're saying de nada, but it just doesn't seem to be working. They're not... They're not uh... And every time they open the door for me, I say baguette. And for some reason, they look at me weird. It's really strange. I didn't tell you this uh, from our lab earlier when we were teaching, because uh, I knew you make fun of me. But the small group session, uh, there were like six students and a couple instructors. And every time I made a point or said anything, the other instructor translated it into French, which I thought was fine. I was like, well, they just don't understand English that well. And then I realized that the whole rest of the presentation, everyone was speaking in English. Uh, the other presenter was speaking in English, and they were all talking to each other in English. So it was only when I spoke in English that they translated it into French, which uh, was pretty I didn't, funny. I didn't realize you spoke English. Yeah, I guess that's I guess that's the problem. But seriously, we really are having a great time. We haven't figured out if uh, it's safe to drink the water yet or not, but we're having a good time <laughs> regardless. Uh, so getting into pericardial fusion and tamponade. Sorry, I got a bit of a cold. So pericardial fusion. I think you guys know what that is. It's anechoic stripe around the heart, fluid in the pericardial sac. But we don't really care if there's an effusion or not. What we really care about is, is there tamponade or not? Then you can have a pretty big pericardial effusion, but that doesn't matter. Does size matter, Mike? Uh, I no. guess no. The I answer mean, well, is no. Yeah, it's, it not really isn't about the size. Uh, it's about the pressures and how the size, how that effusion affects the heart. So, Mike, can you can you tell us how to how to differentiate small, medium, and large? What those different sizes are? Well, there's a few different... No, wait, stop. You, I just lost all confidence in you. I just said that size doesn't matter. And here you go trying to explain how to tell them it's in a small, medium, and large pericardial effusion. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm furious right now. But I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. You did write these lectures. I but I remember, I remember getting these lectures, and I thought, you know, that's really nice. Mike's written this lecture for us. It's less preparation that we have to do. And then I saw this slide, and I wish that you were sitting beside me so that I could punch you in the face for talking about the different sizes and how they tell the difference in the different sizes. In fact, you know what I'm even more mad about is the fact that you've infuriated me enough to make me go on this rant. Think of all the things that our listeners could have learned in this time. To be honest, I'm not even sure that I'm going to be able to continue at this point. All right, so is there a pericardial tamponade here, Mike? Actually, first, is there an effusion? You don't want to talk about the size? I don't want to talk about the size. Don't make me hit you. All right, there's obviously an effusion there. Everybody can see the big effusion here surrounding this heart. But there's no tampon on. There's no real effect on the heart. The heart looks totally comfortable flopping around in that big sack of fluid. <laughs> <laughs> what, and what about here? Is there a pericardial effusion? Is, is there a big pericardial effusion here, Mike? Yeah, that's a huge pericardial effusion. Oh, trick question. So this is a big effusion, but this is a plural effusion. And now even trickier question because there is a pericardial effusion. So this is an important point before we really start talking about what tamponade is and isn't. A pericardial effusion and plural effusion are very important to tell the difference in. A, a pericardial effusion, 
will come down in this peristone long axis view and point anterior to the aorta, which you can see here, whereas a pleural effusion will kind of be posterior to the aorta. So very important distinction. And this is a very small effusion. It's only in the dependent portion of the heart. Again, this is anterior on the patient. This is posterior. You don't really see any effusion up here, so this is really not causing any problems. But if you saw this huge effusion, uh, it would be bad to stick a needle in this and try to drain it when that's really just a pleural effusion. So let me get this straight. You say that small pericardial effusion is not important because it couldn't cause tamponade, right? No, I'm saying the size doesn't matter, but it's not causing a problem here. I, I'm not actually worried about the cold killing you anymore. I think it's going to be me before the end of this if you keep talking about the size of pericardial effusions. What about this? Now, this is tamponade. All right, this is an obviously fully collapsed heart. You actually don't see a whole lot of fluid. There's fluid back here, and I think there's probably clotted blood up here. If you saw this, Mike, uh, what would you do? How would you drain this? <coughs> That's a really tough question. I would look in a different window. So I'd look subcostally and apically and assume that I could probably find a bigger pocket in one of those two windows because there's not much except for posterior on this one. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, obviously, you're not going to get any fluid out if you come in right here, right underneath the probe. So you have to have a different window if you want to drain this. We'll talk about drainage later. We're really talking about how to make the diagnosis first. And this is how you make the diagnosis. These are the things that you look at. Right ventricular collapse and diastole, right atrial collapse and systole, pulsus paradoxus, which is getting a little crazy. We're talking about tricuspid valve and mitral valve inflow velocities, and IVC dilation. So we're going to show you that, obviously. We're not just going to talk about it. So right ventricular collapse, as you can see on the bottom, that happens during diastole. During systole, the ventricle is kind of collapsing down, ejecting blood, and then during diastole, it's trying to fill, but because of those increased pressures in the pericardial sac, you get that little indentation that you see there as that right ventricle tries to fill with blood. And the opposite thing happen, happens to the right atrium. During systole, when it's trying to fill, you get that collapse there. You get that indentation from the increased pressure in the pericardial sac. So Matt, is one of these more sensitive than the other? Is one easier to see? How, how, do, I, how do I use these? Yeah, that's a nice question. Um, we talk about, it seems like we talk about the right ventricular diastolic, diastolic collapse more often, but actually right atrial systolic collapse usually happens first, so it's generally considered a little more sensitive. I think we talk about the right ventricle more often because it's easier to see. We get that quick parasternal long axis view or that quick subcostal view, and you can usually see the right ventricle pretty well better than you can see the right atrium. So I think that's why we tend to focus on it. But really, if you've got a great view of the right ventricle and the right atrium, the right atria should collapse in systole before the right ventricle collapses in diastole. What about this? You think this is uh, tamponade? What would you call this, Mike? Uh, that's definitely pushing towards tamponade. It looks like there's a little man jumping on the trampoline. Great. So I think this makes an important point. This is an obvious tamponade, and I think it's, it's a little subjective. Uh, when you really talk about what's tamponade or what isn't, if you ask two cardiologists, is this tamponade or not, they're not always going to agree. I agree that this looks like early tamponade to me, and, and what we're seeing is the right ventricular free wall collapsing just a tiny bit in diastole. And Mike mentioned the little man jumping up and down on the trampoline. We've mentioned this before, and Chris Fox is the first person that I heard describe this, but it looks like there's a little tiny man jumping up and down on the right ventricle right there. So this big effusion looks like it actually is causing a little bit of tamponade, early tamponade there. That right ventricle obviously isn't completely collapsed. This patient still has pretty good forward flow, but they're on the verge. So what we would expect as this tamponade got worse is for this right ventricle to collapse even more until eventually there was no forward flow. And then eventually the LV would be small and collapsed and hyperdynamic. Exactly. So here's a picture of peristernal long axis view. Uh, same patient or probably the same patient because it looks pretty similar. A little bit of collapse on this right ventricular free wall right there. And you can see that a little better if you cheat and freeze and then sine back and forth frame by frame. You can see that collapse a little more clearly right here. What about this one, Mike? Is this tamponade? Mm, that's starting to look like tamponade. I would agree, but it's tiny. So this is a great illustration of the point that the size really doesn't matter. This is a pretty small effusion, so this is definitely going to be an acute effusion. You can uh, build up a huge effusion over time, not have any tamponade. This one's really small, and you can see a little bit of collapse on this RV free wall right there. It would be really great if there was a way that we could tell whether we're in systole or diastole, because it's kind of hard to tell just looking at a B-mode image. Mike, let me show you something. You're going to love this. <laughs> All right, so 
you're right. I mean, what is Sicily? What's Dastley when that heart's beating pretty quickly, especially if, if it's kind of tamponade and you're pretty tachycardic, it's, it's really hard to tell. So Invo can be really helpful. So what we see here is a subcostal view. You have the RV right here. You have the M mode cursor coming through, and first you hit the RV free wall, then the septum, then going into the left ventricle and hitting the mitral valve. So that corresponds with the image you see here. So you can see the mitral valve E and A wave, E and A wave. So when this mitral valve opens, that's diastole, right? This area right here. So if we look up from this area at this RV free wall, which is this line running right here, you see this little dip during diastole. So this is right ventricular collapse during diastole. Really cool trick with M mode. Here's another example of that. Not quite as clear on the, the E and A wave, but you can see the mitral valve opening here, then over here again. So when the mitral valve opens, that's diastole. We look up, here's the RV septum, the RV free wall, and see that dip, that right ventricular collapse during diastole. So let's talk about the right atrium. Here we can see a pretty good image of the right atrium. We said before we don't talk about it quite as much, probably because we don't see it as well. But this is what a normal right atrium should look like with a pericardial fusion, no collapse during systole. In contrast to this, so you've got a big effusion, we see the RV, we don't really see much RV collapse per se, but this right atrium, it's got an obvious big indentation there, so it's kind of like the upside down little man jumping up on the trampoline right there, anti-gravity. It's like a man punching a trampoline. So <laughs> would you say that it's best to look at the right atrium in the subcostal and the apical windows then? Or is that where I'm going to see it the best? Yeah, that's exactly what I would say, Mike. I will say the apical and the subcostal view are the views that you're really going to see this. So if you don't see any right ventricular collapse, you can get a good image of the right atrium in the apical view of the subcostal, then go for it. Sometimes you'll see earlier tamponade than you would if you're waiting in the right ventricular collapse. I know you saw when we mentioned this earlier and you rolled your eyes at us, talking about mitral valve and tricuspid valve inflow variation, but this is not as complicated as you think it is. If you just stop for a minute and think about the physiology, I think you can understand this. I think this is going to make sense to you, and we'll tell you why it's important in a minute, so stick with us. First off, let's think about this. During inspiration, we're decreasing our intrathoracic pressure. We're decreasing that pressure and pulling air into the lungs, and at the same time, we're kind of pulling blood up through the IVC. That's why you see the IVC collapse. And so you have increased flow across the right side of the heart, across the tricuspid valve. So during inspiration, you have increased flow across the tricuspid valve. In contrast, during expiration, you're pushing air out of the lung. You're, you're increasing the intrathoracic pressure, pushing air out of the lung. The lungs are getting smaller. You're also kind of wringing blood out of the lungs through the left side of the heart. So the left side, the, the mitral valve inflow variation is increased during expiration. So this is normal. So this is normal in everyone, but it's exaggerated with pericardial tamponade. So what you see is with normal respiration, this mitral valve inflow variation, it goes, it goes up and down. So as you can see here, we have an apical four-chamber view. We have a pulse wave Doppler through the mitral valve, the left side of the heart. And as this person is breathing in and out, the mitral valve inflow varies over time. Now, the normal for mitral valve and tricuspid valve inflow variation is quoted uh, different things, different places. Some uh, I've seen it 15% for mitral valve and 25% for tricuspid valve, or 25% each. It kind of depends on what you read. A, a good general number is about 25%. Hold on there, hot stuff. So I got a quick question. Actually, I got a couple quick questions. How do you know whether the velocities are during inspiration or expiration just on this image? So when they go up or when they go down, how do you know? To be honest, I don't care. I'm just looking at the percentage change there. I mean, one way I could tell is because it's written down here. Uh, and I also could think about it, when it, what it changes with inspiration and expiration based on the physiology that I explained to you a little bit earlier. But who cares? You look at the biggest one and the smallest one and you calculate that difference. So here we see that the peak velocity is about 100 and this velocity is about 70 so that's about a 30 percent difference or greater than 25 percent variation which is abnormal which is exaggerated so this effusion looks like it's causing tamponade because it's bigger than nor the normal 25 so let's practice what about this patient so again an apical four chamber view with the pulse wave gate through the mitral valve you see there's an effusion the question is is there tamponade or not so we see here this variation, 
And when we look at it, the maximum seems to be about 180 centimeters per second. The minimum looks to be, the minimum velocity is about 120 centimeters per second. So 180 minus 120 is 60 over 180. That's one third. 33% clearly above the 25%. So this is tamponade. Here's an example of not tamponade. If we look, we have the pulse wave gate through the mitral valve. We took a look at the maximum, 59, over the minimum, 51. That difference is 12.5%, so within the normal variation. Now, I told you I'd tell you when this is important, and that's when you have a patient that maybe has chronic elevated right-sided pressures. For example, a COPD patient, who the right ventricle is getting really thick over time, and it's really tough to compress that right ventricle with the effusion. So in those patients, you're really not going to see much of a right ventricular collapse at all until all of a sudden that pressure is built up so much that it's just complete collapse. And it's just harder to see that collapse as well. So this is an earlier clue that this patient has tamponade than that right ventricular collapse. IVC dilation can also be helpful. We debate the IVC all the time, how useful it is, if you can really tell if the patient's volume responsive by looking at the IVC. But IVC can give you good information. For example, if you've got tamponade, if you have obstructive shock in the chest, then the IVC should be dilated and not really collapsing at all. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really underutilized tool, Matt. The last time I looked at this, there was a study back in the in sort of the mid-'80s that looked at the sensitivity of IVC during, uh, during uh, pericardial tamponade, and I think it was like 98%. It wasn't a big study, but I think for the most part, if your IVC is collapsing, you are almost certainly not dealing with tamponade. Yeah, you know, pretty much anything that we ultrasound, if you take it in isolation and say, how good is it for this or that, it's probably not going to be perfect. But when you combine this with all the other information you gain from the chest, the different views of the heart, it can be really helpful and help to confirm or refute what you think is going on. So what are we going to do about it when we find these? How are you going to treat it? This is, uh, this is something that we don't do very often. This is one of those skills in medicine that you're not going to get good at by doing 10 and failing a few times. This is something that you have to know how to do, you have to memorize, and you have to be excited to do it. If you hesitate at all, then it's going to be too late. So that's why we're going over this. You're going to want a pericardiocentesis tray. However, if you don't have that, or because you don't call for it very often, the nurse can't find it, just use a central line kit. That'll be fine. You're going to need your ultrasound probes because you're going to want to do this under ultrasound guidance. For that matter, if you don't have a central line kit, if you just take off 60 cc's out of the pericardium, that's going to buy you some time. Yeah, syringe and a needle at, at a minimum. If you've got a kit, great. But get the syringe and the needle first and then worry about the kit later once they have a blood pressure back and a pulse. So you're going to do this under ultrasound guidance, and you're going to go where the biggest pocket is. That's really important. We always talk about pericardiocentesis and doing it in the subcostal window, kind of going through the liver. And I think the reason we taught that in the blind approach is because do you really want to go for an apical approach or a, a peristernal approach if you're not seeing exactly what you're doing? I mean, because you could cause a pneumothorax. Obviously, you're pretty close to the lung. But when you're looking with ultrasound, if you've got a good peristernal lung axis window, that means that there's not lung tissue between the probe and the heart. So if you've got the biggest pocket there, that's probably going to be the safest place to go. Obviously, other things to consider in that equation, but it's usually, in general, just the biggest pocket. You don't want to hit the myocardium, so that bigger pocket is going to give you more room for more room to make minor errors. You want to do it under ultrasound guidance in real time too. We, we do some procedures, it's fine to do the static technique, but we really want to do a dynamic technique here and watch the needle go in the entire time. And I, we're demonstrating here with the curvilinear probe, and I think that's important to mention because you're pretty much always going to get a better view of the heart with a phased array probe, and technically we're using a phased array probe here. But if you get a good view of the heart and the pericardial fusion with a curvilinear probe, you're going to be able to see the needle better with a curvilinear probe than you will a phased array probe. And you'll be able to see it better with a linear probe as well. So technically, if you were able to get a good view peristernally with a linear probe, that would be acceptable as well because you can see the needle really well. It's kind of a trade-off between visualizing the heart, getting a great picture of the heart and the effusion, and then also being able to see the needle figuring out what the best probe and location is, taking all those things into consideration. So if you've placed the central line, then you should be able to do this. It's a, pretty much the same cell in your technique. You aspirate blood. Once you've got blood, you thread a wire in through the needle, dilate, and put a catheter in. And that's it. You've got a pericardial drain. 
it's really not that much more difficult than a central line. It really shouldn't be any harder other than the fact that you're sweating profusely and the patient is going to die if you don't succeed. So here's an example of an ultrasound-guided pericarditis with a phased array probe. And you can see here, you just can't see that needle very well. And you've got a pretty small margin of error, not all that big of a fusion. This is scary to me. And this is why I say if you could see this well with the linear probe, it may be okay to use that. You really would like to see that needle. And obviously you're aspirating as you go so that you try to find as soon as your needle tip gets in there. But you saw there that kind of poked in quite a bit. With a small fusion like this, you could see how you could indent the soft tissue all the way to the myocardium and poke straight into there. One way to avoid that and make sure that you're not dilating into the myocardium and placing a drain into the right ventricle is to use agitated saline. So that's the first tip and trick that we want to talk about is agitated saline. This is what it looks like. See that all these bubbles, this con looks like contrast around this heart. This is from agitated saline. So we don't really see a needle at all there. Phased array probe, we're not really going to see the needle very well. We came in, we we're aspirating, boom, we get something. We think we're in the pericardial sac. And then we flush. We don't have a completely empty syringe on when we're aspirating. We've got a syringe with saline. And we say agitate here. I mean, you could go through the process of with the two stopcocks agitating this or shake it up and creating these micro bubbles. But really, if you flush really fast, you be, should be able to see this. And it really lights up well if you were in the myocardium. A lot of you know this from confirming central lines. Uh, when I have a resident... Uh, this place a central line now. Just one extra step to make sure they're in the vein, not the artery, in the IJ. Is I'll take the phase ray probe, go under the under the the sheets, take a quick subcostal look, and then have them flush a quick saline and watch the right atrium, the right ventricle light up. And you would see it light up here if you flushed with the needle in the myocardium, or you'd see it light up in the pericardial sac. This is very helpful before you dilate, making sure you're in the right place. Yeah, and I just want to say thanks to Rob Arnfeld for this image. Who he uh, he sent me this image, and I think it has nothing to do with the fact that it's uh, purple. Uh, I don't think that's weird at all. Nothing strange about the purple image. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, and what a great looking guy. So you want to go in plane when you're in this procedure. A lot of procedures that it's fine to do out of plane or in plane, short axis or long axis. But this is one you really do want to see the needle the entire time. You want to see that whole needle, and not just a tip that you could easily lose. So go in plane. Don't get fancy and go where the fluid is. We've already talked about this, but wherever you have the biggest margin of safety is where you should go. If you have a big peristernal long axis pocket right here, go for it. And you know that there's the risk of lacerating the coronary artery if you go in the peristernal long axis view, but if you get a big pocket, then that risk is mitigated. If you have a small pocket there, then you're gonna to wanna to think about that more. Or if you have a big subcostal pocket and a small peristernal long, go for the subcostal because you don't wanna lacerate that coronary artery. That's a bad thing to do, but it really is going to be safest to go where the biggest pocket is. All right, can we get to some cases already? I mean, let's learn how to apply this. Great point. Before we do that, though, we want to give you guys some time to study this. Watch it a couple times if you have to. Go read about it, and then we're going to come back with the cases, and you can actually test yourself. We'll give you a case, see how you would treat that case, what you would do, and then we'll give you what we would do. Also, before we go, though, a couple quick announcements. Castlefest. We've got some inquiries about group sales. We haven't set anything up for group sales. We just haven't really seen the need for it. But if you're from an ED group and you guys want to come together, email us and we'll figure something out with you. We'll get creative residents. We want residents to be able to come, but we realize that it's kind of expensive to come to a conference in a castle if you're getting a resident salary. So we've developed a scholarship for you. If you convince one of your attendings to come with you and they pay, attendings have CME money usually, just laying around, then you come for free. They're your sponsor. We have a few of those, not a lot of those, uh, but a few of those. We want some residents to be able to come. What about medical students? I mean, we got to give something to the medical students. Well, same thing. So we're going to give out five free medical student scholarships. So the first five medical students that email us and say, you want to come, assuming that we like you and that you don't smell funny, we're going to let you come to Castlefest. And the same thing applies to medical students. You're going to use the same resident scholarship if you do know an attending, but you don't have to find an attending. You can just come and we'll be your sponsor. If you don't know anyone, they can come with you. We also want to go nuts when it comes to hands-on learning and active learning at Castlefest. So as soon as you sign up, we're going to send you an email link where you can watch the entire Castle Fest from last year, edited in HD, and if you need CME credit, there's actually CME credit attached for it. We want you to be 100% prepared to learn when you get there, though. Do your studying ahead of time, and then you can learn hard during the day and play hard at night instead of studying at night 
when everyone else is playing. If you want to watch the lectures, there's still going to be the lectures the day of, and we're going to be streaming those into the other rooms so that you can practice while you're watching those lectures, or you can ignore the lectures. You've watched it all ahead of time, and you can just practice with our instructors. Oh, uh, one other thing, Matt. Uh, sorry about Sweden and Smack ultrasound being full again. Uh, our bad. But just to be clear, Smack itself isn't full. The regular non-ultrasound workshop part is still taking registrations. See you guys next time with some cases. ultrasound that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation get out there ultrasounds parts lungs my vcs let us know how you feel about it